Okay, so like you heard, uh, my name is uh, Richard S. Mahesa Niranjan. Uh, I use Niranjan as my name for all purposes. So informally, people call me Niranjan. Formally, people call me Professor Niranjan. And undergraduates say Professor Niranjan. And, wow. <laughs> because they need high grades uh, in their coursework, right? Um, so I see there are at least two people in the room who have taken my course. So halfway through, I will stop if I want to go to the bathroom or get a drink. And Shia uh, uh, and the gentleman here will continue the talk. Yeah. Uh, so that would be a nice uh, test for them, even though they have both got good grades in the exams. Uh, okay. So this is going to be a tough one because when we started this, you might have heard, we thought there were going to be about 20 people in the room, and we will hack some RD kits with them for the week. Uh, now there are 85, uh, some of you here and some of you online, so it's quite a large one, large class. So I'm not sure how I'm going to pitch this. I'm going to sample from material that we use in teaching uh, and see how it goes. So and looking through the backgrounds that you wrote in your application forms, I got the impression that whatever I say, half of you might get lost and the other half would get bored. Yeah. <laughs> so how does one manage this? So the trick I have chosen is that a long time, I'm gonna try and make sure that everyone could be bored half the time and lost the other half, <laughs> okay? So condition on every student, we might get a temporal variation of sorts. Okay, so that's, um, so let me start with a broad overview of machine learning. And then I'll take you through the foundations of this subject. What are the things that drive this subject? What are the assumptions? Where are the algorithms coming from? Where can you go wrong? And then I will also along the way, pitch some of the very recent developments that have been happening. Yeah, so it's, it's a big jump from the basics to the most modern. But I take the very strong view that without the basics, it is very easy to become a data scientist these days where all you need is some data and some Python code. You chuck the data into the Python code, something will come out, yeah? That would make a data scientist of today. This is very, very dangerous, yeah? In any serious business, you have to face the fact that garbage in can produce garbage out. And the trick, the skill you need, the training I'm supposed to provide my students in this university is to recognize that garbage. When is it garbage? <laughs> and the next problem, of course, is how do you fix it, right? But if you can't recognize it, you can't even fix it, okay? So that's uh, the nature of the beast, okay? So let's start with what the subject is about. So machine learning is about data-driven modeling. So you will know that people are, who are architects build models. They want to put up a building, so they go and build a scaled version of it. And if the client is happy, then they go and build this. So it's a model that they build. Civil engineers build, what do they do? They want to build a bridge, they build a scaled down version of the bridge, they go and try to smash it with a hammer, and if it doesn't break, then they go and build the big one. Okay. Um, people who are systems biologists who want to understand how the heart beats, how cells divide, people who are physicists building models of uh, economy, uh, models of how, uh, whatever, air pollution spreads, how the weather changes, they would go and look very specifically at an understanding of what's going on there. Yeah, they would find the laws of nature, find little laws of physics, write out differential equations that describe the relationships between variables as we know them. Yeah. And then they will have some, you know, in the case of cell cycle, 10 differential equations with 20 parameters will perfectly describe how cells uh, grow and divide. Yeah, so that's doable. So then you would uh, solve in very few cases analytically, but in a large number of cases numerically, that bunch of differential equations. And the solutions that you get out would be an explanation of the world, would be the predictors of what the weather is going to be like tomorrow, when the stock market will crash, all that stuff. Yeah? Machine learning people are not as clever as physicists. Yeah? So we work with data-driven models. Yeah? What are data-driven models? The problem given to me at the very beginning is given by loads of data, yeah? And data comes in various forms, and that will also tell me what are the kind of problems that I'm trying to solve. So here, the simplest way, so that's data. So you have, you can think of some X as some input to some system, and you hit some system with X, and the system produces targets that are T, and there are capital N of that, 
Yeah? So there is one kind of data, data in which there is some input X in some multidimensional space and some targets T in that space, in, in an other dimensional space. And there are capital N of these. Yeah? Often X is in some high dimensional space. Yeah? In very simple problems, it'd be two, three, four, five, and so on. There are very large problems in genomics, in uh, natural language processing, where X could be in hundreds of thousands uh, of dimensions. Depending on the target T, the problems could be different. So T could be class labels that tell you what the camera sees is a bicycle or a grandmother crossing the road. Yeah, so we would be solving, but we might call a classification problem if T's are labels of classes. If T's could be continuous values, like tomorrow's price of uh, stock index, yeah, then we would be solving what's known as a regression problem. So both regression and classification problems fall under a banner known as supervised learning problems. So we would think of X as going uh, as covariates going into an input, T as a target to achieve. You could interpret that T as a supervision signal in whatever that's going to follow. And we'll be solving a supervised learning problem and classification and, cl sorry, classification and regression are two types of such problems. Sometimes you might only give me the X's. There is no targets associated with any of these hexes. And you might still say, do something with it. Yeah, and there are things I can do with it. The first thing is I might look at the distribution of hexes. So these hexes may not be distributed all over the world. They could be in different small parts of the space. Yeah, in the space in which X is measured, hexes could be in some small parts, highly dense, dense. And in other parts of the world, you wouldn't find any of them. Yeah. So I could characterize the density of X in that space. And based on that density, I may be able to make some statements about the underlying problem. Sometimes these X's may have been measured in very high dimensions unnecessarily. So these days we know it's becoming increasingly easy to measure things. People who are instrument builders are out there building lots and lots and lots of instruments. A lot of advances that we see in science are coming from the instrument builders building instruments. And then not knowing what to do with it, they create a lot of data and then hire me and I make a living out of that as well. But we might have gathered, archived, distributed loads of data in high dimensions. Some of it may not actually say anything about the underlying problem. That's why I might be interested in subspaces in that high dimensional space in which the data actually lives. Yeah? And if I am able to discover those subspaces, if I'm able to discover cluster structures in the data, if I'm able to characterize density of the data, data, I'll be solving what I might call an unsupervised learning problem. And that's of interest. I might be able to make some statements about the underlying problem domain. Yeah? So we looked at supervised learning, unsupervised learning. Okay? Let's take the supervised learning for the moment. I think there may be some reason to believe that this data is not coming out at random. There is an underlying physical mechanism that's generating this data. If so, the relationship between the input and the output is something I might be able to approximate by forcing a mathematical function through this. And so that is my starting point. If I'm unable to make that assumption that there are smoothness properties that I can capture by throwing in a function, I have no start. Yeah, so this is my starting point. So I'm going to say the output target, the response T, is going to be given by a function of the input, parameterized by some parameters beta, and there is some noise in the process. Yeah, so this is my starting point. Once I do that, and you have given me this data, N of these data items, I can then go and estimate parameters theta by minimizing some error. Yeah, so here is my error. The error is the difference between the target that you gave me take away what my model outputs at that input with theta as parameters. Yeah, I square it, I sum it over all the data, and then what do I have? I have an error. And once I have an error, then what do I do? I'm going to minimize this error with respect to theta, find where this is a minimum, and then I have learned something about the underlying system. What have I learned? How best does this function that I assume fit the data that you gave me? Yeah. Once I do that and grab a value for theta, I can do predictions. What can I now do? You come and give me a new data point, x at n plus one. Initially, you gave me n to learn from, to train from, to fit functions from. 
Now you give me a new data that you have not shown me before. I have theta hat, which has the parameters that I have estimated by fitting this function through the data that you initially gave me. And then I can make a prediction on that n plus one's data. Of course, if this prediction is very good, you will pay me a lot of money and become very rich. Yeah. If this prediction is really, really bad, then uh, we are in trouble. The garbage in garbage outcomes here already is beginning to hit us. Once I have trained this on some data, maybe to do with chemistry, and I throw at it some data that's coming from, I don't know, some stupid things like self-driving cars or whatever, it is still going to produce an output. Yeah, that's where trouble begins. Before that, I might now recognize that I'm fitting a function, parameterized function through this data, and I have good maths friends in the building next door, they can teach me lots and lots of very complex functions. So simply by choosing a very complex function, I can fit all the data that you gave me with zero error. Now that doesn't sound good, right? So if I were to fit the data you gave me perfectly, the extreme version of it is nothing, do nothing at all, but store the whole thing in a table, yeah? Then we haven't learned anything, yeah? So your ability to predict on unseen data is not going to be good if you minima put your error to zero just by choosing a complex function, yeah? Once we recognize that, what would I do? I would go and do regularization. What does it mean to regularize? I'm going to set up an error function, which consists of a term that's based on the data that you gave me. That's the first term here. And I will impose some penalty on the parameters that come out. I'm no longer going to allow these parameters to take arbitrary values to make the error zero. I'm going to constrain them. <clears throat> now that initially comes as a way of smoothing the fitting process that I'm taking here, but there's more to it than that. This is also actually a way, this gives me a handle to inject some prior knowledge about the problem domain. Remember I started by saying I'm different from physicists and engineers and uh, architects. I'm only stuck with data, but I also have domain knowledge. My problems I've uh, solved do not come from arbitrary places. They're coming from a particular domain. And that would tell me something about the function that I want to fit. And if I had that knowledge, this gives me a handle to inject that prior knowledge into that. And there are little things that I can really see that as we go along tomorrow, I can, for example, say this function should be smooth. It should not make arbitrary rapid changes. It should be smooth. And I can choose a regularizer here, the taken off regularizer or quadratic regularizer that will force out a smooth function. Sometimes I might think this function should consist of, um, it should consist of a very small number of basis functions. It should be sparse, yeah? And if I have reasons to believe that this function should be sparse, I can induce a particular type of regularizer known as lasso regularizer, and we'll see examples of that tomorrow, um, that will help me achieve that sparsity, yeah? So on this line, I already have a, try to avoid fitting a very complex function to bring down the trading error to zero. B, I have found, given myself a chance to inject prior knowledge, some prior knowledge about that problem domain, okay? Oops, that's not what's supposed to happen. Uh, oh, this will do it. Yeah. Now, remember I told you about modeling uncertainty that this is going to make a prediction if you have trained it on chemistry data and throw it uh, self-driving car data. So all the time in the whole process, there is uncertainty happening. And how do we model uncertainty? The tool comes from uh, Bayesian statistics. And I will start by writing out a probability density over the parameters conditioned on data. So I'm not interested in calculating just one value for the parameters. I will characterize how uncertain am I about the parameters that come out as by characterizing a probability density. Yeah? If I can do that, then what I will be able to do is to offer you not just one prediction on your unseen data, but an entire probability density on that prediction. And I could summarize that by saying, I'll give you an average and a standard deviation on it. So you will have an error bar on it. You will say your perceptron is 90% accurate, plus or minus 2%. And 90 plus or minus 2 is very, very different from 90 plus or minus 8. Yeah? So that's, that's the kind of um, 
a place we can go if we start modeling uncertainties. And when we do that, we'll be making probabilistic inference. And the probabilistic inference we make normally is coming out of an expected value of some function of the parameters. That's how it normally happens. And how do you calculate expected value of some function of the parameters? You would take that function, you multiply by the probability density, integrate over that entire space. Yeah, that's the way you calculate averages or expected values. Okay. And when you do that, in the very simplest of cases of what P theta is going to look like, you can do this analytically. That's textbook examples. You can, in a math department, set some exam questions, and it's not much more useful than that. Yeah. But once you have, but what you would do often in practice is not to do this analytically, but to do Monte Carlo integrations of this. How do you do Monte Carlo integrations? You sample these thetas according to this probability distribution P of theta. And at each of those samples, compute the function, and then you go and average them. Okay. There is an, and now remember this theta consists of parameters of a function that I have thrown in. Yeah. And this could be very, very big number. Yeah. So in some of the modern neural net type literature, this could be hundreds of thousands of parameters, millions of parameters. In some very simple models, it could be three parameters, five parameters, and so on. It could cover a wide space. But still, there is a relationship that tells us that the, how well you can approximate this integral by this average depends only on the number of samples that you have and not on the dimensionality of theta. Yeah, because you're not being judged on how well you model the density, you're being judged on how well you do this integration. Therefore, this works even in high dimensions. If not for that, life will not be fun. You will not be able to do this. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying there is, you have a P of theta in some very high dimensions. So normally, and I'll come to that a bit later, high dimensions are bad news. Yeah, we should run away from high dimensions. Okay, but this integral being approximated by the, uh, by the summation, by the average, the quality of this approximation or the variance you get of doing that is not dependent heavily on theta. It depends on the number of samples that you draw. Okay, and the reason behind that is that what you are being judged on is the quality of how well you estimate the average and not on how accurately you describe P of theta. Okay. Okay, so uh, do remind me, please ask questions like we just heard. And when you ask questions, also remind me to repeat the question, okay? Because there are people on Zoom and I just uh, made a mistake there. Okay, so, so that's, uh, we often do this. And then there's a whole other area. And that area is, remember I told you that you gave me end data items. Sometimes you want to make my life a little bit more difficult and challenging. You will give me this data one by one, yeah? If you're solving time series problems, if you're solving control problems, then data comes to you one at a time. So sequential estimation becomes a problem where you don't minimize the error and estimate parameters using all the data. You make an estimate based on the data you have, and as data comes along, you're going to update that estimate. Yeah, a lot of signal processing problems fall into this category. And uh, that's what sequential estimation is. And this notation describes it quite nicely. This notation says, I have an estimate of parameters theta at time n minus one, using all the data that I have seen up to time n minus one. When I have knowledge of how the dynamics is behaving, how things are changing over time, I can make a prediction of what these parameters might look like next point in time, but using all the data only up to the past point in time. And then you hit time n and you have seen a new data. And then you update your estimate theta at time n using all the data up to time n. So that sequence of prediction, correction, prediction, correction is what drives in the linear Gaussian world what's known as the common filter. Yeah. If you relax one of those, if the world is not linear or if the world is not, if the noise is not Gaussian, then this common filter is no longer the optimum. There's huge literature coming out on uh, things called particle filters. 
Yeah, those are non-parametric ways of characterizing the density, and you don't make assumptions about Gaussianity or linearity, but you can um, filter in a prediction correction framework. The other major topic that comes broadly in the sequential estimation world is reinforcement learning. So remember earlier I told you about all the data given to me with which I'm going to make um, supervised learning or all the data that you gave me with which I'm going to make uh, density estimation or unsupervised learning. There are fantastic problems coming out, really challenging problems is what really borders machine learning to what we might call artificial intelligence is where problems where you do not have an immediate knowledge of what's going to happen. You have not drawn a lot of data from some underlying distribution. What you're left with is you interact with the environment to grab data. Yeah, game playing is a classic example of this. So imagine playing chess, I make a move, my opponent makes a move. And by making a move, I have changed the board position. The opponent makes a move, changes the board position. We go about 40 moves before I know whether I have won or lost. Yeah. So in between, I do not have an idea what's where I'm leading to. So there's a sequential decision problem that underlies that. Yeah. But from one position of the board to the next position of the board, there's a transition that's very well defined. Yeah. But any board position must have some value how good this board position is in order to win or lose. The closer you get to win or lose, you know that board position will be a definite win. Yeah. You have captured all the pieces that you know you're going to win. But right at the beginning, you do not know this. So how do you backtrack that position and come to this and make a move from here is the credit assignment problem that underlies the whole area of reinforcement learning. <coughs> there are huge advances in reinforcement learning recently with, uh, you would have heard the chess playing champion can't be champion anymore. The go playing champion can't be champion anymore. This guy apparently has actually stopped playing go now. Uh, so yeah, so, so these are, major, major advances that happened in reinforcement learning uh, of recent times. A lot of headline grabbing advances in machine learning and AI are coming roughly in this area. Okay, so, so that's my overview of machine learning. That's just about anything you can identify, recognize in the subject of machine learning can be mapped to some corner of this uh, slide. Uh, I could claim this is the world's shortest tutorial you've ever heard on um, machine learning. Uh, and yeah, we can go home now. So no, maybe not. So yeah, so we will see. Um, so this slide, in fact, I wrote about 12 years ago. Uh, and uh, this is, was also almost perfectly valid when I was a PhD student of uh, some, uh, well, I won't tell you, uh, long time ago. Uh, but we'll try and identify where new developments have taken place, what are the interesting problems, but stick to this as a framework with which we will look at the world. Yeah, but continuously we'll remember that we want to know what the fundamentals are, what the assumptions are, where the limits are, where the restrictions are, so that we don't recognize garbage and sell it as uh, data science. So what would I do with this? Here are some books. Um, the Duda and Hart's uh, pattern classification book. I always have this. It's a beautifully written book. It's extremely expensive. This was the book in which I learned. Uh, it's called Duda and Hart. These, by the way, these slides are in the team's uh, page. So uh, you're all members of a team, Microsoft team. Uh, and uh, I have uploaded lots of my slides over the weekend in there. Okay, so you don't need to, you know, focus your eyes uh, with difficulty. Uh, so Dura and Haas book is uh, my favorite book. Therefore, I have to have this here because that's where I learned everything I know from. Uh, Bishop's book on pattern recognition and machine learning. If you really want to get into the subject, this is a great start. And this is what I teach from. Uh, it's beautifully written, very easy to follow. It's, it's heavy stuff sold very nicely. So I, I think it's very good. I, I know the guy was, so I need to say good things about it. Uh, he takes a very nice probabilistic approach to the whole thing, right from the beginning, from day one, it's a probabilistic approach, uh, but almost an introductory level uh, to people who want to enter the subject. Kevin Murphy's book, there is a second version coming out right now. It will be out in the shops very soon. This is very much the same tack, but it has a lot of the detailed technical knowledge of probabilistic machine learning in here. Lots of example, lots of detailed knowledge here. 
right? So it's in a way more advanced than Bishop's book in that sense. If you have a slightly different statistical flavor that you don't like parameters as theta, but you like them as beta, something like that, then you don't like the target as T, but target has to be Y, yeah. Uh, then uh, Tipshirani Hasty's book is uh, pretty good. It's again, well readable, very intuitive and so on. To get more practical with the subject, this is called Hands-On Machine Learning with SkyKit Learn. This is a place to start. But actually this book is a lot more than just hands-on. A lot of the textual description of, description of insights into algorithms is pretty well written, okay? So this is again, a very, very good book. And then when you jump into the techniques of deep learning with very large deep models, uh, Goodfellow Bengio's book is the thing to do, yeah? So these days there's a lot of bite-sized information in uh, you know, Stack Exchange and all these places. But to get seriously into a subject, I think uh, books still have great value. Uh, and hence, I put these books up. And I'm also driven by what David Hume said some time ago. And this will make me redundant. So, so there's nothing to be learned from a professor that you are not going to encounter in uh, books, right? Um, and uh, David Hume, a long time ago, uh, he didn't, uh, oops, where is this way? Um, Wikipedia entry says Hume had very little respect for professors of his time. <laughs> so hence he studied everything from books. But uh, remember, professors had the last laugh, the guy didn't graduate. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to throw some punchy, important concepts at you. Yeah. And the very first thing you will hear this and see this in literature here and there is known as the curse of dimensionality. So I just actually said this, dimen high dimensions are bad news. Yeah, why and how? So suppose you want to um, represent the probability density. Yeah, so there is, uh, you know that the probability density where I'm standing is very, very high uh, with respect to where the piano is. So you want to leave evidence for future archeologists <laughs> who come 400 years from now and dig in this space to figure out that probability density here was 10 times as large as probability density there, yeah? So what would you do? You will go and find uh, 10 stones, leave it here. Uh, you would leave one stone there and then you die. And then 400 years later, archeologists students can dig and they will find 10 stones here, one stone there, and they know density was 10 times as high here than there, yeah? So you want to do this to a higher precision what would you do? You would put 100 stones here and 10 stones there, yeah? So the future archeologists 100, 400 years from now will know that this was 10 times as much as over there to a one more decimal place uh, accuracy, yeah? So you can keep doing this. Now, if the world was one dimensional, then what you have to do to, you will have to take this world and split it into equal bins and calculate how many stones should I leave here? How many stones should I leave here? How many stones should I leave here? And so on in one dimension, yeah? And then you will leave that many stones and die and future, all that happens, right? Suppose your world was two dimensions, then you have to split this world into regular grids, rectangular grids, and then go and calculate how many stones to leave in each of these. And you know where the story is going, oops. No, you don't know where the story is. Um, if it's in three dimensions, you have to split the world into cubes and so on, yeah? Now, what is known is that to maintain the same precision, sorry, to the same accuracy, at higher and higher dimensions, the number of stones you need goes exponentially with dimensions, yeah? So if you want to preserve density, communicate density by leaving stones or data, yeah, then the number of data that you need in order to maintain the same accuracy at higher and higher dimensions grows exponentially. So that's what's known as the curse of dimensionality. The term hits in various different ways in various different places, but accurately representing densities where it hurts in this way, in this particular way, that you need exponentially more data to accurately preserve density. Earlier when I talked about the sampling, I said to you that the dimensionality of theta doesn't really matter to me too much. Yeah. Even in high dimensions, I can do Monte Carlo integrations because I'm not judged in how accurately can I specify a density. I'm judged on how well I can predict the average. 
Yeah, I will with those numbers. Okay. Okay, so that's one important point. So, like I said right at the beginning, but let me just have a check on time. Where are we now? Sure. Okay. So now I have roughly half an hour before coffee, is it? Okay. Okay. That's fine. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is to jump from, like I said at the beginning, from very basics to uh, what's going to be one of modern machine learning. And, and I may deviate a little bit from the topics that I put out in the agenda. So this class is we're going to look at uh, this overview. We'll go and look at estimation. And then we'll go and look at uh, classification problems. Uh, and then we will move and, and look at linear regression. And through studying linear regression, we will learn some of the concepts relating to regularization. Yeah. Uh, and then go into neural nets and how neural nets are trained and so on. And then we will go towards the end of tomorrow into various tricks and of the trade when you go from small neural nets to large deep neural nets. Yeah, there's a big jump there. We were working with small neural nets uh, in the 80s, 90s, and so on. But now very recently, we worked with very, very large neural nets and that's scaling up. Why we were unable to do that in the past? What makes the tricks that, what tricks we have in the bag that will make this work and so on. And if time allows, I'll take some examples in chemistry. But um, my hope is you get what the basics are and in a way that you can project from the basics to something big yeah? and solve your own problems and so on. So the subject is a very rich combination. It's a combination of probability and statistics, function approximation, linear algebra, dynamical systems, software engineering, and power computing. Yeah. So we what the what the subject is driven by, all the neat tricks that you can pull out of all these areas, and uh, composing something that's uh, better than the sum of its uh, parts. Okay. Oops. I, yeah. Go on. That's language, okay? So what is machine learning? What is statistics? What is artificial intelligence? This is a continuum. And that continuum has also changed over time. Yeah, so, right. So to me, everything that I have here comes under machine learning, yeah? However, it is everything, I, a lot of what I have already said if there was a statistics professor in this room, we know exactly what are you talking about? This is what I teach, right? So what's happening in the subject of machine learning is the rich combination of all this. And we draw ideas that have been developed in probability and statistics. We draw ideas that are in linear algebra, yeah? And we solve big, large problems. The kind of tools we would use when we solve time series control problems, for example, a lot of the basic ideas have been in dynamical systems. Yeah, so people in control literature have been working with these. So common filtering has been around since the 60s. The term machine learning perhaps did not appear at that time. Yeah, the term neural nets was motivated by people trying to understand what, how brains might compute. Uh, the idea of the perceptron and all that stuff, that those language comes from there. Yeah. So I'm not that worried about the terminology here. Um, so I think it was John Foster who was a who was statistics professor in this university. At an away day on campus, uh, we gave talks one after the other, and we could very easily have given the talks using the other person's slides. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. Okay. So um, I have also shared with you some lab sheets. So if you think the summer school is going to end